Welcome to Multifamily Rockstars. If you are new to apartment investing or already experienced, you will enjoy this show. You will hear from the leading experts in multifamily real estate so that you can be a better owner, operator, and investor. Real people, real stories, life changing. And now, your host, Ryan Christopher Nunes. Welcome everyone to Multifamily Rockstars. Today we have Dax Ferguson of Heritage Construction and Consulting. Really excited to have Dax on the show. We're going to be walking through CapEx construction and what to look for when you're buying multifamily apartments. Again, Dax, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. Dax, walk us through your background. Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Went to school for theater of all things and um uh, got done with school and went and had my dream job. I was a theater consultant building uh, performing arts theaters. And so we did rigging, lighting, um, all the stuff that goes with building a theater, uh, performing arts theaters and enjoyed it for a while and um, left that, le- left that world and started building home theaters and uh, pretty high end home theaters uh, for a lot of people in California and the Hollywood Hills. So uh, had a lot of fun doing that. And then got into the high tech world, some software uh, stuff, uh, building dental offices and uh, equipment there, and uh, left that world to come come to really the construction of uh, homes and multifamily. And uh, and I say construction, it's we really do rehab, right? So we do we don't do anything ground up. We only take what's there and make it better. Um, so. That's the type of construction that we do. So that's kind of my history in the construction world. Uh, me, I'm married. Uh, have a wife. Been married 24 years. Uh, we have nine boys. Uh, no girls. Uh, ages are 20 to N. five. Some people, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some people think we're crazy, but uh, it's part of our story. It's uh, what motivates me to get up and go to work every day and. Uh, you know, it's a lot of work to, to take care of a family that large. And my wife does a great job. All I do is go and work. I think I have the easy part. <laughs> she has the tough part. But, hey, um, we all have our place in this world, right? And things and jobs that we're supposed to do. So do that. I live on a farm in McKinney, Texas. Uh, you know, 2015, um, kind of got away from the single family construction world and, and really started focusing more on multifamily and it's been a uh, journey, but a fun journey. Uh, I realized that uh, multifamily is mostly a business decision. It's not, not as emotional as working in the residential mm. space. And so um, I like building business, uh, building businesses, making business decisions to help the businesses grow. And so I've kind of taken what we do as swinging hammers and, and things of that nature into helping them spend the money in the right area to build their business, to get the maximum return on their investments. And so um, I have lots of things that, that uh, I teach and talk about have nothing to do with what I do, but it's how to make them better, better owners, better syndicators um, and make the property better. So we'll, we'll be talking a little bit about that today. Awesome. Awesome. No, that sounds great. Appreciate all that background. Um, let's dive right in. Imagine that we're on a property tour. What are the things that we should focus on from a CapEx perspective and R&M and a repairs and maintenance point of view? Sure. So, you know, we go out, you know, you submitted an LOI and, you know, you're like, okay, I'm getting serious about buying this property and I need somebody that knows what the heck they're doing to come out with me and, and do it. And we do a lot of these walks. But we're walking, we're looking for your main expenses, right? So is there a foundation issue? And we're not going to get out and measure it and make sure that, you know, it's, you know, three quarters of an inch off and a 30 foot span or whatever it may be. We're there to look and see if there's any evidence of some foundation issues. But also, is there any evidence of repairs that they may not have told you? So mm-hmm. if it's brick, have they done some mortar repairs and things of that nature that they haven't fixed the foundation, but they've done it to make it look pretty for when you show up. And so we look for a lot of those things. Roos, obviously another expense um, that I wouldn't say is overlooked. I would just say 
a lot of people go by what the owner says and says, Hey, I had it replaced five years ago and, and it's in great shape. Well, if you're in Texas, you know, every seven years you have a hell storm, if not sooner. And uh, the roof may not be in great shape. The owner, the current owners typically don't live on site. They may have missed a hail storm or two and there may be damage there. So you really need to have a full evaluation of all of that. Boilers um, and chiller systems, um, you do need to have those looked at and uh, make sure that they're serviced correctly and see if they have any maintenance reports on them or uh, just any updated document. Obviously, make sure they've been inspected by the state um, and the time requirements that they're supposed to be, uh, whether it's one year or two years. You need to have those documentation just so you know that everything's running properly. At least it was last time it was inspected. So those documents are, are important. Um, and then I look at, um, hey, what do you want to do with the property? Right. So your roof's good. Your foundation's good. Your siding is it in decent shape. Uh, do you want to paint the property? Um, do you need to add some amenities, right? Do you need to add a pergola? Do you need to add uh, outdoor kitchen area? What do you need to do to add to this property to bring a real value to the residents, right? So it's not about you anymore. It's not about what you want. This is what's going to bring value to the residents and create a stickiness factor with the residents so that they don't want to leave at this point, right? And, and then we also help you create a story to tell the res current tenants, current residents of, hey, this is what we're doing. I know going through the construction phase is a, a pain in the rear, but you're gonna go through it and here's the result you're gonna get at the end of it. Because once you get to the end of it, look at everything you're gonna have. And so if you get buy-in early from your tenants, they're not gonna leave, they're gonna wanna be there. They're gonna, oh my goodness, these guys actually care about the property, which means in turn, they're gonna care about me and take care of my needs as a resident, you know, that leaky toilet or leaky sink that I've had for the last year and a half that I can't get anybody to fix, well, they're actually going to take care of it. So those are the types of things that really are beneficial to your tenant base that you want to really hone in on initially when you take over a property. So you just kind of look through those, those aspects. Okay, no, that's really helpful. Um, you know, if we dive a little bit deeper into that, kind of those were the expensive line items. So you had mentioned boilers and chillers. And um, how often should those be maintained? And you said, you know, pull service records. What, what, yeah, what's so, um, you know, I'll use the state of Texas because I'm most familiar with that. So you're supposed to have it inspected every two years and you're, okay. that's supposed to be documented. Um, some uh, counties or cities require you to have them inspected annually from one inspector and then every two years from another type. So it just depends on, and again, I'm not the expert in that field, but I do know enough about it to tell you, hey, pull those records because if they don't have them inspected, you could get fined for them. And okay. so you need to make sure that those are up to date. Uh, but also when those get inspected, if there's an issue, they're going to point it out, right? And so you can have a third party come in and inspect them before you purchase. It can be kind of pricey to do it initially, um, but if those records aren't up to date, you definitely need to have that done. And it, it could be a few thousand dollars to have that done, but it would be worthwhile to make sure that, you know, you're up to date and you're doing everything's running the way it's supposed to be running there. And is that the same for the chiller as well? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, you know, as we, as we, you know, chillers are kind of a four letter word for some folks. So uh, do you prefer large chillers or multiple small chillers on the property? So um, not a huge Maybe walk us through. Let's take a step back. What, what is a chiller? <laughs> yeah. So chiller is a centralized, um, you know, air conditioning system. That's a, a chiller system. It has a water tower that cools and cools, uh, helps cool down the air, right? So we all know traditional HVAC system with condensers um, and, and whatnot outside of the unit. Then you have your air handler inside that blows the air. It's not much different than that. Um, and it, it's fine. The only issue is they're large expense items, right? So if, if it goes down, it goes down and you got to get it fixed and your whole property is down and it's a major deal right? Well, if it's one person, it's really easy to go get another air, uh, condensing unit or an air handler and fix that and replace it. Snap, it's, it's done. Um, your chiller system is going to take a little while. 
it's it's going to be down for days um, and, and hopefully just days. So um, it's not to say, hey, don't be scared, don't do don't do it, stay away from these properties. There's still some really good properties that have been maintained very well that have chiller and, and boiler systems, but um, you know that that they've been maintained um, and they're okay. Don't don't be afraid of them. It's the ones that um, don't allow you into the closet on your first look because there may be some issues with it that they don't want you to see and scare you away. So those are the things that you're going to have to be really cautious of to make sure that, you know, it's being taken care of properly. Uh, I just, I hear horror stories, but also other people are like, man, I love these properties because I'm in control and I can take care of it and I can do this and I know enough about it now. Um, you know, you're going to do build backs and, and all of that. And people like that or all bills pay. So, uh, it's just kind of what kind of, what kind of sponsor do you want to be? Do you want to be, um, one that, you know, does chiller systems and boiler systems or you will be one that doesn't. And, um, you kind of see people fall into those territories of what their expertise is and what they do. Um, but we kind of handle it all. Got it. Got it. No, that's, uh, and then what, what part of the problems, I guess, when we were talking about whether do you prefer a large chiller system or multiple small chiller systems? Well, small. Um, and the only reason for that is because the whole property is not down at one time. It's not this major catastrophe. It's, it's a building or two. And yes, it's a major problem. You have to handle it, but it's a lot easier to get those in, a lot easier to get them, uh, have access to them. They don't have to be uh, shipped in from across the nation or wherever. And just to give listeners kind of a frame of perspective, how much of these chiller systems cost to replace if you needed? I'm the wrong person to ask that. Got question. it. Okay. 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 Um, yeah, I, I, they're expensive. Uh, I mean, that's really all I can tell you. But um, we don't replace them often, right? We um, we tend to maintain, and uh, in fact, I don't know in all of my years that I have actually ever replaced a new one. I've only maintained or repaired. So um, I would not be the expert in that field. Um, there's plenty of people out there that are smarter than I am when it comes to this, but um, I just know the issues that come, come from them. Okay. And, you know, if you could just tell the listeners what a boiler is and what are some things to look out for there? Yeah, so your boiler system is your hot water that is dispersed through the whole property versus having a um, independent water heater in your unit or independent per four uh, units or building, however they've done it. These are going to be larger water heaters is really what they are, larger water heaters in more of a centralized location. Um, they're going to be uh, large capacity, large uh, output um, water heaters, and um, they take maintenance. Uh, you know, when you look for a maintenance person, you need to make sure if you have a boiler system that you, they have experience in that. They know how to repair them. Uh, they know where to get the parts for them. They, they just have some experience here um, because if they don't, it could be very costly to bring somebody in every time. When you have somebody on site that knows what they're doing and knows how to maintain them, it could cut your cost in thirds. So okay. um, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's a basic, just a glorified, huge water heater that uh, is in a centralized, centralized location, Got it. whether it's per building or per property. And do you need to be certified to work on a boiler? Like your, your, let's say your maintenance person, does he need to be certified to work on a boiler? Yeah, he'll have to have some certifications, but it's a lot like your HVAC certifications. Okay. You can work on them um, if you take the class okay. um, and it's worth it uh, as a sponsor uh, for you to send your maintenance staff to these because the money it will save you. Sure. Um, and investing in your investing in your maintenance staff is always a high recommendation because they see you as someone investing in them. They're not just there for a job. They're, they, they represent you as a company and uh, they take care of you and you're, you're better interest on the backside. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, so switching to plumbing issues, what are some things to look out for there? So cast iron plumbing um, is, is always a major concern. Um, you know, they collapse, they break, uh, tree roots grow through them uh, quite often. Uh, and I'm not saying go in and replace everything and say, hey, I, 
I've got to stay away from this property. But you need to have them scoped and you need to have them uh, hydrojetted, right? So hydrojetting basically cleans them out. It, um, you know, anything, anything that's caught up in the system, you hydrojet it, it cleans everything out, sucks it out, gets it out of the way, uh, whether it's dirt or gunk, toilet paper, hair, whatever it is that's caught in your lines. It just cleans those out, kind of gives you a fresh start. And then you can camera down those lines and make sure that there's no cracks, no tree roots, no dirt, things like that that's getting in your line that can cause problems. They can be repaired um, without having to replace the whole line, depending on where the repair is. If it's under a building, obviously you're gonna have to tunnel under the building and do a repair. Um, if it's outside of the building, uh, then you can just dig and fix it there. The hard part is if they run uh, up and down the building between the units uh, okay. up and down. And those are a little harder because you got to cut in the wall, you got to cut it out and you're going to disturb some tenants. Um, so if you have a leak, you got to fix it, but, uh, but it's just something to worry about uh, when you have those. Those lines aren't easily scoped, so those tend to not be scoped. You just have to watch for those visually. So. Okay. And is there you know, a point where you recommend replacing versus repairing? If you're under, you know, if you have a, a large section uh, under a building that's needing to be replaced uh, because it's collapsed, maybe the foundation um settled there and it collapsed the lines and it's just been this pool of uh sewage underneath your building sorry but if that's what it is you got to dig it out you're already there uh, to replace 10 feet or 30 feet is not generally that much more expensive you're already there you've already mobilized out there so i would recommend you know maybe go ahead and do it all uh save you some time later if it's ever going to happen um but it's it, on multifamily, it's not something I, I tend to go in and say, let's go tackle this out. It just tends not to be the go-to answer. It's let's fix the problems and move on. Okay. And then the difference between plumbing and sewing lines, maybe you could just touch on that. Between plumbing, plumbing and sewage, sewage lines. So um, uh, they're used interchangeably a lot. So understand the difference. And it's a great question that you bring up. So you have the water supply line, which brings water to the building. And a lot of times uh, old school was that's all in copper. Um, then they came in with PEX, uh, PEX lines, which is a plastic, you'll see red and blue. There's some that are brown, but red and blue, generally speaking. Um, and blue being cold and red being hot. Um, depends on where it comes from and um, you know copper is a great way to go right so copper's old school it's more expensive uh, but it's, it's a great way to go so if you have copper you're in pretty good shape not often are you having major issues with your copper your PEX lines obviously cheaper we mass production uh, in multifamily in the 80s and um, they threw a lot of this in in repairs uh, switched out, pulled copper, and put in PEX. And so um, they're fittings, and they're plastic uh, fittings that uh, they break down over time or can break down over time. Uh, there's runs of, of the PEX that have been bad, and so people get leaks from them. Um, not the end of the world if you have PEX again. Um, it's just something you need to know. What are you dealing with, and what's the best solution? Now, the great thing about PEX is if you have a lot of vacant units and not a lot of people are coming in and stealing your PEX lines like they would your copper lines because they can, you know, your squatters can steal that and take it and go recycle it and get some money. But um, generally speaking, um, you know, it's just kind of a couple of ways. Your, your sewage lines, obviously, is what's taking water and sewage out of the building. And so you'll have some PVC pipes. Um, which is the newer way um, or rehabbed way, if you will. Um, and then you have cast iron. You also have clay, um, which is really old school. And those break down pretty easily. Um, but not, not that often do you see those anymore. So okay. kind of your different areas there. Awesome. Uh, and then switching over to roofs, uh, what should people know about having flat roofs? They're going to leak. 
<laughs> There's no way around it. They're going to leak. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's new or uh, 30 years old. It's going to leak at some point. Um, and that's okay. That's, it's okay. It's going to leak, and you're going to fix it, and you're going to patch it. So you think of it this way. Um, if you have your AC condensers on the roof, and um, I won't get on my full soapbox here, but if you're going to have your AC condensers on the roof, um, there's going to have maintenance that's going to have to happen to those AC condensers. And if you have um, what's called a TPO roof, which is, um, which is a great roofing system, however, if you have AC condensers on the roof and a tool gets dropped, it's very difficult to locate the leak that you may have. So I always try to say if it's a you need a new roof on a flat roof and you have AC condensers, I would steer you away from TPO. I would steer you to what's called a modified bitumen roof. Now, modified bitumen roof is a great roofing system. It's similar to a shingle, which we all know, a granular uh, has granules on it. It's tar backed uh, behind the granules. It's a tough, more robust system, um, and it it will last you um, a, a little bit longer when you have the ACs. Um, if you have a modified bitumen roof on there already, but it has some wear and tear, you can put a new one on top of it, or you can do a uh, lesser cost system, which is a silicone coating on top of that modified bitumen, and you can get a 10 or a 20 year uh, warranty on top of it. Okay. So um, there's a lot of solutions there for flat roofs. Um, and, and I, I can't tell you adamantly every flat roof, this is the roof you have to do. It's very circumstantial. So it depends on the situation you're in will be the roof I would recommend. But I will tell you, if you have AC condensers, please don't get a TPO roof because it will not last you as long and it won't be under warranty if they drop a tool. Gotcha. And can you just walk us through what that TPO means? Um, TPO is a brand. It, it's a it's a it's a uh, type of roofing. There's different manufacturers of it, of course, but um, it is a sheet material. Um, and most simplest way I can explain it, it's like a tarp type material. It's it's pretty robust. It's not going to rip generally, and it's not going to weather. It's very durable um, as it comes in a roll, and then you. Uh, heat weld it together at the seams and it becomes this one you united envelope over your roof and um, it works great uh, uh, like I said the only time is when some there's a lot of traffic that has to go up on that roof that's when you have to be really careful because I'll be honest maintenance guys don't care how much you paid for the roof they just don't uh, HVAC guys that you hire to come in and service stuff they don't really care that much about your roof there's no way that you can track it back to them so they're going to do their job they're going to do it as fast as possible and as efficiently as possible for them and not worry about that kind of stuff and this is generally speaking so you got to be careful you got to be careful in what you do to protect yourself and to protect your asset sure awesome no appreciate that and then what would you say is the life of a flat roof versus a pitch roof so it depends on the material, but you know, 10 years, um, 10 years is probably a, a good estimation of what it's going to last you. Obviously, if you have a hailstorm, there's going to be some other issues that come into play there. Um, but um, 10 years is, is pretty good how it's going to warrant you. Now, if it's tar and gravel roof, which is again, it's an old school type of roofing system. Um, hail doesn't penetrate gravel. Um, the only thing it does, it's going to leak and then you're going to, rake the gravel back, put some tar down, rake the gravel back over it, and, and you're good to go and you can kick the can down the road a little bit further. Um, but you know, 10 years is a good rule of thumb. Yeah, it's gonna last longer in most cases, but that's kind of your warranty, where your warranty sits. On and that's for pitched roof as well? That's so that that's flat. Now okay. pitched, um, you have uh, lifetime shingles these days, right? So even if it's three tab or um, or architectural shingles, which is there are two major types of, of shingles that people use in multifamily, um, a lot of them have lifetime warranty from manufacturer defects. The only thing that's going to damage them is wind and hail 
um, and people. So uh, wind and hail, thank goodness, are covered by insurance, but people aren't. And people getting up there and, and walking around excessively on them. And it's, they need to be walked on. So it's, I'm not saying they can't. I'm just saying excessive walking and uh, high traffic areas. Uh, they're going to wear down. Your, your granules are going to fall off and um, they won't last you as long. You're, when you take over a property, if it has a shingled roof, we do a lot of what we call walk and seal. So we'll walk it and we'll look for any exposed nails. We'll look at all your penetrations. If your boot, uh, plumbing boot where your pipe comes up and needs to be replaced, we replace that. Um, and we re-caulk around it. Uh, where your vents come through, we caulk around those to make sure they're good. And so we walk all roofs and make sure that that's done. If there's a missing shingle from a windstorm or whatever, we replace that. So that's always a good uh, rule of thumb. Just because it has a couple of missing shingles doesn't mean it's a bad roof. Uh, it could just need a walk and steel, and uh, you can go down the road. What does that cost? Depends on the size of the building, but average is you know between a thousand and two thousand dollars per building. Okay, uh, to, to do it. Okay, awesome. And then uh, you had touched upon foundation issues before, and I just wanted to circle back on that. How, if someone's walking through a property, how can they see? Or what are the telltale signs of foundation issues? So if it's brick, um, you'll see what I call a zipper line on the, on the outside of the brick. So if you watch the mortar joints and you see there's a crack going up the mortar joint, that could be a simple settling of the building, right? Not necessarily a foundation issue, but a, kind of the building settles a little bit. There's some cracks there. But when you start seeing it go through the middle of a brick, that's when you want to start getting concerned and go, okay, there's probably a bigger issue here than a little bit of settling. So um, that's one of the major signs. If it's a, if it's a stucco building, stucco will kind of, if it doesn't crack, it will um, come out and, and you'll see some areas where it will kind of bulge and you'll go, okay, there's something going on there and you'll want to have a foundation person. Again, that's on the exterior, but on the interior, you really want to walk. And if you feel, it's almost like a drunk feeling, right? When you walk in and you're, you're walking downhill and you just, just feel like you're like, why can't I get stable here? Something's wrong. <laughs> you probably have a foundation issue, but it's always when you're on the second floor, that it, it's magnified, right? So whatever happens real close to the surface may you know be a half inch, but once it gets up to the second or third floor, it could feel three inches, right, by the time you get up there. And so that's where you want to go, hey, I don't want to just walk base level floor. I want to walk, you know, upstairs and, and uh, see kind of how it feels up there as well. So, uh, but you'll see cracks in the sheetrock, um, You'll see uh, doors and the way that they don't shut or stay open all the time, or they'll close themselves. You kind of look for all of that. Um, people have gotten very good at covering up cracks on the interior um, from foundation stuff. So that's not always going to be your only place to tell. So I say look at the floor because they're not going to take up the floor and level the floor out. That's, that's one sign look at the brick. They're, they tend to fix the mortar joints. Um, they'll put some caulk in it and you can see repairs in the mortar joints and through the brick. So just keep a close eye on that stuff. And that'll give you kind of an idea. Hey, there's, there might be a foundation issue here that we got to address. If you see painted brick or hardy over stucco, is that, you know, buyer beware signs? No, no, not always. I, um, I paint brick a lot, right? So, um, one of the reasons I paint brick is not only because of foundation issues or past foundation issues that have even been repaired. It's because bricks changed, right? And color schemes change and people don't want this old style brick. Um, that's just ugly. I mean, it's just ugly. And they, 
didn't fit with where they want to take the property. Maybe it's an old, old world and it's a pinkish brick and they're like, Hey, I want gray, you know, paint scheme through here. It just doesn't work well together. So a lot of people paint brick because they want to change the scheme and they want to change the whole feel of the property. Um, that's important. That's important to change the whole feel of a property in many cases. So I can't always say it's buyer beware. Okay. Uh, but buyer be cautious and, look <laughs> and, and, and follow all the steps of, you know, is there mortar cracks that have been filled? Cause you can still see those under paint if you're looking for it. Um, okay. uh, so always be cautious. Awesome. And then shifting to federal Pacific boxes, um, why are those problematic? What one, what are those and why are those problematic? So federal Pacific panel is, is a panel. Um, it's a stab lock panel. It is a brand of a stab lock panel and um, stab lock panels in general. Um, as most of us know, if uh, we overload a circuit on our breaker panel, it pops the breaker. Uh, well, in apartments, uh, in older apartments specifically, they don't have, they didn't have the power needs that we have today. And so our demands on power is much greater than ever before. And so we tend to overload circuits, um, especially in older properties, we overload circuits more so today than ever. Well, if you have a Federal Pacific panel, those panels are known for the breaker not tripping and sticking. And when it can't trip and it sticks, it's a live stick and it causes it to heat up. And when it heats up, it tends to catch on fire. Not always, but it's one of the largest causes of fires next to grease fires in apartments in multifamily okay. is because of the stab locks. So what we're seeing uh, with stab locks is insurance companies are saying, hey, if you've got it, you're either going to have a huge premium that you're going to have to pay to, to keep it or you can replace it and we'll, we'll cut down on your, your cost of, uh, of your insurance. Or if you want to keep it, your premiums here, but we're going to exclude if a fire happens or something happens because of that panel, you're not covered. So if you're the owner, is that something you want uh, you want to have on your shoulders that if a fire happens from this, you don't want to do it. So it can be a major concern for you and it's something you want to know going into it. So if you go in and you're doing due diligence and you see that it has federal Pacific panels, it's a quick call to your, to your agent and go, Hey, it has federal Pacific panels. I want to make sure I'm covered for it. Or they say, well, we don't have anything that we can cover you for you're going to have to replace them. Okay. Well then you need to budget in your rehab to, to go through and replace them. And so not something you're going to be able to raise rents. There's nothing sexy about it. It's just something that you're going to have to put into your budget and uh, you won't, you won't have much uh, issues when you go to sell the property down the road because you've already done all the changes. And so it will help you on the resale later on. Okay. And what should people budget for replacement for those? So I'm going to go on the high side because I, I like to be cautious on this um, and I don't know all markets. And so some of you guys aren't local to me or in my market. So I always say for the panel, I would budget a thousand dollars. Okay. And that will take care of your panel and the breakers included. Okay. If you need to go and replace uh, your plugs and your, all of your fixtures for electrical in the place, and put GFIs in your wet areas and things like that. I would always recommend adding another 500 onto it. Okay. So the it's two parts. Just the panel is going to be about thousand dollars with new breakers and all of that. And then the secondary part is going to be your plugs and your switches and things of that nature okay. and your okay. GFIs. You can do one without the other, but let me just explain something while we're yeah, while we're on this path. If you plug something in and it doesn't trigger the breaker, it's the fire tends to come out of the plug side of things, whether it's in a wet area, if you don't have a GFI that's going to trip, it's going to come out of the plug area before it comes out into the breaker panel. So if you don't put GFI there and you do put a new panel in, you're safer because it tends to trip 
However, if you don't replace your panel and you do replace um, with GFIs and other things in the, in the apartment, you're safer, right? Mm -hmm. So if you say, I can't afford, you know, $1,000, but I can afford 500, it may be $300, but again, on the high side, $500, then you may be okay. And that's at least a place to start that you're doing something in progression that needs to be done. Um, but the ultimate fix is obviously spend money and doing both. Got it. Got it. And then, uh, no, I appreciate all that input and insight. Um, hitting CapEx, what do you see as the largest return on investment for exterior projects? Wow, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff I could cover here. So um, it, anything below the rooftop is, is really a, a, a very generic statement here, right? So for one, paint always tells people you're there and you're taking care of your property. If you have railings that are not in the greatest shape and taking care of those, um, it's a perception thing that, hey, they're coming through and they're, they're taking care of the safety issues that I have here. Of, eh, this isn't very secure. It's okay, but it's not secure. Um, adding amenities is probably your biggest, strongest um, ROI okay. uh, piece that you can get. And so why is that so important? Um, because we're all in this business, um, sponsors, everybody, passive, we're all in it to change people's lives, right? That's, that's our goal. Yes, we're going to make money while we're doing it, but we're all in it to change lives and make lives better. So if you come into a community and the kids have nothing to do, the kids are going to be bored and the kids are going to find something destructive to do. Hey, I've got nine kids. I know kids get bored, man, they find something to do. Maybe good, may not be good, but they're going to find something to do. And it's not always playing video games. It may be outside, but it may be picking up rocks and throwing them at windows, right? It may be um, riding a skateboard or a bike in the parking lot, which is not a safe thing, right? Um, it may be grabbing a can of spray paint and spray painting the side of the building. It could be all of these things. But if you create areas that create community, right? So you create communities in community or create community in communities, um, such as outdoor kitchens or grilling, grilling areas, pergolas, which are gathering areas, any common place um, for people to gather creates a community and introduces you to your neighbors. Well, when people get introduced to their neighbors, they become friends. And when they become friends, they become hard to separate. And when you're coming in and you're adding a playground and an outdoor kitchen and a pergola and these friends, friendship grows stronger and stronger, as you raise rents in these communities, people are more tend to stay there with their friends than to move because it's $50 cheaper across the street. So they'll stay and they'll pay the extra $50. They may grumble for a little bit, but as long as you're taking care of the tenants, they really kind of get over that. And they go, hey, I, I've got so much good stuff here, I don't want to leave. And those things really don't happen mm -hmm. if you don't create this community in the community. Sure. So I'm a big, big believer in creating those types of areas. Now, adding a dog park to a community is great if you have the right tenant base, right? So um, it if you're trying to change the tenant base that lives there because you're trying to bring it up uh, to a new level of tenant base, um, then maybe you want to wait nine to 12 months before you add in that dog park so that you have the tenant base that you want to with the correct animals or dogs that, that would utilize that space. So I would highly recommend kind of uh, getting a gauge of that when you move in. Is this the right time or is this even the right community to add that? So don't just add amenities to add them. Make sure they make sense for that community sure. you're adding to. Um, and um, making things look nice, take care of your tenants. Uh, when you get a work order, take care of it. 
Um, it's plain and simple. It's uh, add extra staff if you need to, to take care of your tenants, because once you take care of your tenants, again, it helps create that stickiness factor and they won't leave. Awesome. And then if we switch to interior projects, what are some that have a high return on investment? Sure. So, you know, carpet gets ruined. Um, carpet gets ruined easily with tenants. Um, you know, so I'm big on putting vinyl plank in, in all areas. I personally like carpet in the bedrooms. Um, okay. That's just me. I like getting up and putting my feet on carpet instead of a hard floor. But, um, you know, sometimes it makes sense to put, you know, vinyl plank throughout um, or some sort of vinyl throughout. Um, but I, I tend to go, let's do vinyl in everywhere but the bedrooms and, and you tend to get uh, longevity out of all that. Okay. Um, you know, your market's going to depict if you can do a hard surface countertop, if you can do granite or, or something like that. Um, don't, don't just go in that I'm going to replace it because this is what I want. You got to make sure that you're going to, your market can afford it. So it doesn't mean you're going to get a bump in rent because you put it in. Um, so you need to make sure that it's the right area. The good thing about doing that is on your turns, you're not going to have the expense of resurfacing countertops and whatnot. So long-term it will pay off for itself, but you just need to make sure that it's the right move for you. Stainless appliances versus black appliances versus white appliances. Again, it's going to be a community thing, an area thing. Um, I don't like white because they get dirty easy. I think black is, looks cleaner and better. But again, it's a personal preference. Uh, if they have all brand new white appliances. I'm not going to go in there and say, well, you need to replace them all because they're white and they're not going to look good in here. Um, just, you know, make sure you're spending money wisely there. Um, always you're going to paint. Um, and just taking care of stuff uh, on the interior. Uh, water conservation is a big one. 50% uh, of your water savings comes from your toilets, just so everybody knows. Yeah, that's uh, an that's, uh, that's easy fix, but it's the most expensive piece of water conservation as well, right? So um, you go in and you do it. It's not just changing a head on the shower or the aerators on your sinks. It's replacing the toilet, which is a, a large dollar item in the grand scheme of things. Um, but it, it is the biggest savings that you get from all of it. No, that's great. Appreciate that, Dax. Mm -hmm. And what are the current trends that you're seeing regarding exterior design features, colors and trend and so forth? I see a lot of grays and cedar. Um, I mean, I, we do a lot of cedar nationwide in the 10 states that we operate in. And we do, we do cedar. There's only one area that really doesn't. And that's going to be in Arizona. Okay. Because it's not conducive to the weather. Um, so you'll see, you'll see cedar in most um, area in the South, Southeast. Okay. Uh, and they look really good and they look really good with grays. Um, you'll see pops of blue, pops of burgundy in places. Um, I always say, keep your base color pretty systematic and, and nothing too flashy on your base wall color where you want to add splashes of color maybe cedar because that adds a splash of color but also on your doors um, your doors adding a pop of you know a brighter color always looks good always always gives it a new fresh look um, so i like that a lot as well awesome and then uh what about interior design features it's all over the map <laughs> Honestly, um, you know, grays are in right now. So I'm sure in, you know, five to 10 years, we're going to go, oh, I'm so tired of gray. It's everywhere. We need to come up with something new. And who knows, mustard yellow may come back. <laughs> then, right. So go back to the retro world. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, gray, uh, you know, gray with a little brown in your, in your flooring, um, driftwood colors, uh, in the flooring are, are real popular right now. Mm. Um, so uh, white on your stone or on your hard on your you know countertop surfaces, um, stainless in certain areas, black in other areas on appliances. But uh, you know, that's kind of generally what we're seeing everywhere. Is there anything that you're advising clients not to put in, whether that's interior, or exterior, even amenities? Um. Yeah. So. Granted, it's a big one um, because if the market doesn't uh, hold true to putting it in, it's going to be a complete waste of your money. Mm. And I'm not about spending money where 
you're not going to get a return from it. In fact, uh, roofing, uh, I don't always advise replacing the roofs. Uh, you know, walk and seal is kind of my go-to and I came from the roofing world. And I love roofs. Roofs are easy. And uh, let's be honest, I make good money off roofs. I, sure, I, sure. I do it, but I, I'm not in this just to make money. Like we talked about earlier, I'm in it for, for you, um, to make the most money that you can from it. Because if you are successful in this endeavor, you're going to go have another one, right? You're going to buy your next property and, and uh, hopefully hire us again to do the next property. So I'm always very cautious in how I approach certain things and um, spending money wisely is, is a big one, but um, uh, metal on roofs, stay away from it um, just because it's, really expensive uh, maybe do an accent occasionally to give a pop to a street appeal but never a um, hey you just need to put metal all over these roofs because it's cool and it's going to make your property stand out it's never a go-to there has to be a viable reason that you want to do that and um, so we just kind of go piece by piece on that and go from there and if you had, you know, you talked about spending money wisely. So if we gave you $500,000 to spend on a hundred unit property, how would you spend that? So assuming the surface of the exterior is good, um, I would start with paint. Okay. Um, you're going to paint it and I would more than likely throw some cedar accents and probably a couple of metal accents um, on there just to give some pop and good feel for the community um i would um spin spin some areas in some outdoor kitchen and pergolas and some community areas uh, if it doesn't have a playground i probably will put a playground in uh, the pool area resurfacing the pool if it needed it um, and really spending some money in that area so that people want to stay there um, and and go there and then office, uh, okay. make your office look really good because making your office look good, that's their first impression. So they may have seen you online, but when they get serious and they like everything else they see, they're going to come to the office. And if the office is a small rat hole of an office, they're going to go, Ooh, well, this is what you have to work in. I'm sure my living conditions aren't going to be much better. So that's kind of uh, the highlights of where I would spend money. There's always some energy efficient ways, um, you know, water conservation, uh, energy savings, go with LED lighting in some places to help save some money there. But um, I can spend 500,000 really fast. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, it's got to make the most sense for that property. And I, I would just say those are some general areas I would spend money. Okay, no, I appreciate that. That's great. And then any tips on how to avoid going over budget on a capital plan? Um, yeah, have somebody, uh, whether it's me or another contractor, go out there early, uh, early in your process. And, um, and how is you, early for you? Yeah. So before you submit your LOI, okay. um, say, Hey, I'm looking at this property and we may digitally walk through it, right? We may go online and look at it and go, yeah, this is what it is. And are you going to be in the area? Can you send somebody by or can you go by and take a look at it and give me some ideas? Um, not, not going too in depth to it, but just getting some general ideas. Hey, what's it going to cost me to paint this? Well, I have some general numbers I can throw at it. Hey, the roof is trash. I know this already. What's the roof going to cost me? Let's go through those high ticket items. And then, um, when you, and, and we always, we're not trying to win your business at that point. We're trying to save your bacon, right? So we're trying to make sure that, you know, if I think it's really going to be $800, I'm going to tell you $1,000 because I want to make sure that you're covered in the end. And uh, there's going to be some, you know, oh, no factor in there that we didn't see. And you're not going to be buried because of it. So, um, you know, that's that's something that, that we really take pride in. And then doing due diligence and doing it correctly. Um, we offer a third party due diligence service, which... Uh, I may be a little biased, but I think it's far, far better than anything else out there on the market that is so in depth and so much information that I can overwhelm you. Um, 
but it gives you every detail that you ever need. And um, so knowing what you're really walking into um, is, is going to be very key in making sure you don't go over budget. Because if I walked into the two models and I said, okay, well, everything is like kind because over the last 10 years they've owned it, they've rehabbed them to this condition. Well, what they rehabbed five years ago and beyond isn't near the condition it is today. And you may have to totally rehab those things again. And so if you're going based off those numbers, you're shooting yourself in the foot, you're going to find yourself in a real scramble uh, to get to the numbers that you that are in your performance. So uh, that's a big piece of it. And so if you could uh, just walk us through your third party due diligence survey, what do you sure. all do? And so uh, we come out and uh, depending on the size of the property, how many team members we, we send, but we, we check everything from rooftops to, to siding, to fascia board, uh, to paint, to railings. We make sure the railings secure. We look at your exterior lighting. And I'm going to start with exterior, then I'll go into interior. Sure. We look at, um, you know, if it's two story and there's some walkways up there, make sure that, you know, that's not cracked. Uh, look at your parking lots. We look at your perimeter fencing. We look at your pool decks. We look at your pool area. We look at your office. We look at your boilers, chillers, HVAC units. Uh, we, we really do a thorough investigation of everything that's there on the property. And then when we get to the interior, we, we walk every single unit. So we walk into a unit we take around averages about 40 pictures per unit and that's going to be the exterior and the interior of your appliances and we're going to show the serial number that associated with that appliance in that unit and that may not be important to you when you're doing due diligence but after you take ownership that information becomes pretty valuable to you so you know the manufacturer you know the model number and the serial number and if there's a warranty issue you can just dial the manufacturer and then have them warranty that issue um, on that appliance and then we look at the flooring and we look at the countertops and we look at the cabinets and we look at the sinks and lighting and and everything we have pictures of it and we tell you um, we categorize things are they good functional or do they need to be replaced and um, we give you a category on everything and there's uh, good as 50 60 questions of things that we go through and okay. we go through every unit and um, it takes you know seven to ten minutes per unit to walk through some people are like oh my goodness that's so long um, but for all the information that we're gathering in that seven to ten minutes mm. it's uh, so valuable to you uh, on the back end and so uh, knowing that going in, knowing what it takes um, per team member to do, and that's how we we come in and knock it out. And then you can look at it in real time. You don't have to walk with us if uh, you're your team and one person can be there, the other can't. The other team member that can't be there can log in. And as we walk units, as we so we log into a unit and we walk out of a unit. We walk out of a unit, immediately all that data goes to the cloud. And the partner that couldn't be there can log in and see the data as we upload, as we're exiting these units. And so that's really valuable because as we know, multifamily is really expanding and, and there aren't, hey, I'm just focused in Texas or I'm just focused in you know Tennessee or Georgia, although that may be a high concentration of your focus, more people are looking in other states. And so as you do that, partnerships are like, well, I can be there, but I can't be there. And, and so it's just a way to really communicate to everybody. Awesome. Man. And then we fly drones over everything. And then we also have a couple of add-on items that we do. We can do a 3D model of, of your buildings and then we can do a dimensional uh, 3D uh, pictures of your full interior Matterport, if you've ever heard of it. Um, there's some companies out there that do it, but we do it in our due diligence so that you have a dimensioned floor plan that you can walk away with. Because we all know that the C-class properties, not many of them have dimensioned floor plans or even floor plans for that matter for the units. Mm. So we help with that. Awesome. Now that sounds really thorough. And so what does that cost you know, per unit? So um, on average, it's $500 per property to set up and $30, uh, $45 a unit um, outside of Texas. Uh, so we have a minimum though. So it's 50, 50 units or more um, outside of Texas um, to, for us to travel and get there and do that. And travel is included. Um, and then uh, scoping lines on average are $250 a line to scope. 
the three D uh, modeling of the exterior um, is a hundred dollars per building. You don't need to do the whole property. Typically, you just need to do a couple of different building types. Um, that's typically pretty standard. And then uh, the 3D interior piece is $250 uh, per interior that we do that for. And again, you only need to do each style of unit. Sure, sure. Awesome, no, I appreciate that. Uh, so switching over to hiring contractors, what are some key questions that people should ask general contractors when deciding to hire them? Well, look no further. I'm your only contractor you need to talk to. <laughs> totally kidding. Um, you know, uh, making sure that your contractor is not giving you a price to make you happy. Um, if a contractor is coming in and they're going, you know, you told me you had $500,000 to do this job. Here's $500,000 of work, you know, that we're going to do. We're going to do everything. Problem with that a lot of times is they're going to change order you on the back end. And um, we really pride ourselves on being really open on the front end and going, well, I know you really won't, you only have 500,000, but you gave us, you know, $800,000 of stuff that you want done to the property. And some of it, you may not be looking at some of these really in-depth things that have to happen to get you there. And so we really kind of walk through what it's going to take to get you there so that we don't have these change orders in the back end. So are there change orders? Sure, because scope changes while you're there. And, and when scope changes, of course, you have to pay for the scope changing. But what I'm talking about is, um, I'm just trying to think of, uh, of, of one thing. You say that you don't want to replace siding, and so I exclude siding from my contract to get me to your number, right? Or repairing siding, because every building has repairs that need to happen before you paint it. But when you go and you start prepping, you're like, well, that board's halfway rotted off, and we're just going to paint over it because we didn't have any budget in there for it. Oh, and the owner comes and goes, Hey, and that board's got to be replaced. Well, it wasn't included in our bid. And so, and that's a simple form of this. Um, and so now it's an add on item or a change order item that, that comes in and creeps in and change orders are what really bites you in the rear end in, in, in the end of the game. And so we try to look at whole, holistically for you and try to cover, Hey, be careful of this. So watching out for contractors that are really trying to make you happy, because if you tell me you have $500,000 and I gave you $800,000 bid and say, call me, we need to talk about this. And you see the $800,000 $800, bid, you may be ticked off that I gave you the $800,000 bid. But when we have the conversation, you're going to understand why it's there. And then we're going to explain what we can do to get you down to your 500 and what, what do you want to change on your scope to achieve your $500,000 bid? And so that's where I would say, be very cautious in your contractor. Um, referrals, man, you can't get much better than a referral. So um, ask around. Um, the industry is a big industry, but it's also a very small industry. And a lot of people know a lot of contractors and a lot of people in this world. Um, and they know some good people and they know some bad people. And so everybody has stories. And uh, I would ask around. And uh, don't ever just pick one because you like the person. I'm a pretty likable guy, but uh, you know, don't don't take my word for it. You know, <laughs> really, really check me out. And make sure that I'm the right guy for you. Um, we just implemented a new uh, job, you know, scheduling software that gives you, um, you know, as we finish projects or as we finish, you know, little key elements in projects, we update the software and you can check it daily and see kind of where we're at on the projects, uh, what percentage of completion, what buildings have been done, what buildings still need to be done. And so a lot of the communication stuff is in there and then pictures can be uploaded in there to show you, Hey, building two, we finished, here's a picture of it. And then you can take that data uh, as a syndicator, you can take that data and share it to your passives and say, Hey, building one's done. We're making progress and send it along the way. So we, we do our best to communicate without having to communicate through phone or text message and things like that in real time. Um, because we think it's seamless, you know, a lot of syndicators, you know, start out, they have, 
kind of a, a full-time job and this is a side hustle for them and whatnot. So they may be checking emails um, as late as midnight and they have the question, hey, I want to see where we're at and they can log into the system and it kind of helps them with that. So trying to put those processes in place to make it easier for everyone. And then for internal rehabs, is there a point where you recommend people using their in-house maintenance crew for the property manager versus hiring an outside GC firm? Great question. So um, we, as an outside uh, firm, will only do if you have 20 units or more. So um, if you call me and go, hey, I got four units over here. Can you come do it? It's not my wheelhouse. It's not, I'm not going to mobilize to come out there and do it. Um, um, but if you call and say, hey, I have 30 down units. I need to get them back online so I can get people in them so I can get rents. And then um, I'm going to have four months after that or, or whatever it is. We'll come in and do the 30 or whatever your initial is. We say we, we set the blueprint for your maintenance staff to come in behind us and go, hey, guys, this is what I want. This is your model. I want everything else from here on out to look just like this. Can you duplicate it from here? And so that's kind of what we – Ex our expertise is or our specialty is we come in and we knock it out and we go from there. Uh, I mean, you know, I typically don't do this many in one month, but you know, uh, in one property we're turning 30 a month um, in Memphis, Tennessee, mm -hmm. and we have about 300 we're turning. So we'll have, you know, 10 months to turn 300 and I better keep on schedule to do it. Right. So, but I, I have a system in place. I can keep that. And there's going to be people vacating while we're doing these. We understand that. But once the we're done and the property is stabilized um, with massive move outs, then they take it from there and they do it. And you may just need to add a couple of extra maintenance guys to help you do your turns. And uh, it, it works out pretty well. Awesome. And then, uh, you know, what is your advice for syndicators or property owners and their interaction during the the CapEx process with the GC company? So um, make decisions early. We, we, we like to come in, we'll um, come up with like a, a color scheme for the property and um, let, let the process take place, right? So we, we have a systematic approach. We come in and, you know, we, prep all the buildings or we prep a group of buildings and then we have painting crews come by that are painting the trim and then painting crews that are coming by paint, painting the body of it. Sometimes they're the same. It just depends on the size of the project. And in doing so, if you let the system happen before you try to critique anything, we'll catch most of the stuff that, that you want to nitpick about in the process. But um, we have found that if you don't know us, you, you want to nitpick everything because you think you're helping the process and going, I don't want them to have to come back and touch this up. Let me go ahead and do this. We already know we're coming back and touching up because there's always going to be a piece that has to be touched up. And so we have touch up crews coming up behind making sure that everything's done. So um, rely, rely on your contact, your GC um, and communicate with him directly. Don't communicate with the labor on, on site. Um, specifically because um, maybe there's a language barrier there. Maybe there is, they want to please you because they know you're the owner and they're going to do it. But then they charge the GC to do something that wasn't paid for, wasn't part of the process. So it, it can get sticky. And then you have a change order that nobody knew about until the very end. So mm -hmm. I just, you know, have one point of contact. Um, hopefully um, there's a system in place to help communicate correctly with that GC and uh, get, get all your needs met. Awesome. And then how do you typically price your projects? You know, we have what we call a, a pre-close bid, and then we have a post-close bid. Pre-close is you submitted your LOI, you haven't closed on it, and you're like, I just need some numbers so I make sure my budgets are correct. We'll give you that. And then once you close on it, you're like, okay, all right, so I only have this much money to deal with. And so now we're like, okay, well, we adjust our scope and everything changes and then that's our close, close, close bid. And, and that's kind of where we fall in line. It's a fixed price bid versus a cost plus. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fixed cost. Yeah. 
And then what advice do you have for people getting into the business, both passives and first time syndicators? You can never learn enough. There's always a place you can learn more. Um, you know, I'm, you know, as crazy it is, I wasn't a great student in school, but now I'm, you know, out of school, I, I feel like I'm learning more and more every day. And I'm trying to soak up as much energy and as much information as possible so that I can be a better contractor for, for the syndicators out there. Because if I learned your business better, it makes me better to help you achieve your goal. And so I really focus on that. And um, I always try to educate myself. The other thing I like to do is find other things that maybe I don't offer that I don't do, but that can save you money or, or bring more money to the property um, to help you guys out. So it's, it's kind of funny that I'm out there seeking things to help you guys that don't really benefit me, but they do benefit me in a way because if you're more successful, you're doing more properties. So I'm always talking to people, always learning about other businesses and other things that could help you be a better, a better syndicator, a better operator. Dax, thank you so much for your time today. How can listeners get in touch with you? So um, I'm pretty simple. You can text me um, or call me on my cell. It's 469-261-1190. My email is dax at heritageccs.com. And uh, those are the best two ways uh, of getting in touch with me. I am traveling more and more these days. So texting tends to work better because if I'm flying, um, I get my text messages while before I even get off the plane and I'm answering questions uh, versus checking voicemails. So uh, that's always a good way to get in touch with me and email. If you, Hey, I want to set a meeting with you to talk to you about a couple of things to a zoom call or something like that. Email is a great way to communicate with me. Um, and I'll set that up, you know, kind of want to get back to the hotel or back to the office or, or something like that to answer those questions. Thank you for listening to multifamily rock stars. We hope this episode was helpful for your personal and professional growth. For more episodes and to learn more about investing in multifamily apartments, check out lifechangingcapital.com.